when he was down, nailed on that cross, the devil should have left him on the ground. Because the Bible said that if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. To hear the truth about the cross, no cross, no salvation. No cross, no deliverance. No death of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. We do not have what we're saying we're giving him. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that you tuned into this broadcast. I do not believe it's an accident that you're watching me here right now. I would encourage you to get your Bible today, to get back, turn off all the distractions and listen to the Word of God because God wants to change your life. In the book of Mark in chapter 15 and verse 34, Jesus is on the cross. He's suffering for you and me. He's in great agony. And he says these words that theologians have wondered about for years and years. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt like you've been forsaken? Like nothing is working right? I can tell you, Jesus knows exactly how you feel. When He was on the cross and suffering for the sins of the whole world, for my sins and your sins, crown of thorns, beaten. They pulled His beard. They striped His back. They whipped Him. They nailed Him, hands and feet, to a cross. Fulfilling the will of God to save us, but he felt like, where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? We have a Savior that can identify with us when, I, when we're hurting, when we're weak, when we feel forsaken, when things don't seem right. It was not right that the Son of God would be suffering so. But the plan of God saw beyond the cross, beyond the pain of the moment, and whatever pain you may be in, whatever circumstance you may be in, God knows that there's something beyond that. And He says, I'll help make it work together for the good in your life if you'll love me and you'll hear my calling. So today as we go into the service, I believe God wants to use this broadcast to touch your heart and change your life today. So go with me now as I take you into one of our services here at Christian Family Worship Center. God loves you, and I love you. Remember, God knows everything about you and loves you anyway. Come with me now. God bless you. The Lord is good. I want you to go with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke in chapter 16. Go to Luke 16, verse 16. I talked about this at the beginning of the service, and I want to read it out of the Scripture to you. Father, we need you today more than we've ever needed you. Father, I pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to come upon me and upon every person in the sound of my voice. An anointing that will destroy every yoke of the enemy and remove every burden. An anointing, Lord God, that would produce what your word says would be produced in the lives of believers. Lord, I thank you today for confirming your word with your presence, with signs and wonders and miracles that follow, Lord. For we believe that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We praise you today, Lord, and I give you thanks for your presence. Lord, in my weakness, be made strong. Take the coal of heaven and touch my lips. Bring peace to my mind and heart and to everyone that hears your word today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look at verse 16. It says, The law and the prophets were until John. 
Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached. Now, John the Baptist preached the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. And the Bible says in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24 that Jesus isn't going to return until the kingdom is preached around the world. So the gospel of the kingdom of God must be preached. And he says, he says, at that, it says, that time the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Now I'm asking you today, are you pressing into the kingdom? Now if you have to get in your car and drive to Lakeland, Florida to press into the kingdom, jump in your car and drive to Lakeland to press in. But if you can press into the kingdom in your living room, then press into the kingdom in your living room. If you could, can do it in a, in a deer stand, do it in a deer stand. If you could do it right here at church, do it right here at church. But we need to begin to press in to the things of God. Amen. And stop this complacency. And see, regardless of what you think about the vessel that God would be using down there, the people that I met down there were pressing into the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you this. In the book of uh, Mark in chapter 16... It says, these signs will follow them that believe. Y'all ever read that before? So signs and wonders are supposed to be following believers, right? Not believers following signs and wonders. So you've got to be careful that you don't chase after signs and wonders. You chase after the kingdom of God and signs and wonders will follow you. Amen. That's where we kind of get off. Some people are down there chasing signs and wonders. I'm going to tell you that right now. But some people are down there that are actually pressing into the kingdom of God. They're hungry for the things of God. And when you see 6,000 people worshiping God of all different nations and all different colors and all different languages, and some of them do, they can't even understand what the man is saying, but they're worshiping God. It's an amazing thing to see. Amen. Now, everywhere you go, you're going to have your nuts and flakes. You know what I'm talking about? So where, where, where you find God, you're going to find the devil. Where you find people hungry for God, you can also find some nuts and flakes. They're there to put on their little show. Amen. Y'all know it. You know, some people, they get up and dance, not to God, so that everybody can see them dance. Because we do, we do, you know, care about how we look and what people think, you know, we want to look good. You know, and so, so, so everywhere you go, that, that's, you can find that in any church. People serve in churches because they want to be seen, and that's your reward. You don't get a heavenly reward. Some people give so that they can be seen. They blow the trumpet when they give. Look how great and how much I give. That's your reward. You don't have a heavenly reward. Some people pray a lot and let you know how much they pray so that you can think about how spiritual they are. Well, that's their reward. They're not praying in secret, so the Father's not rewarding them openly. They're just getting the accolades of men. People fast so that the people can see that they fast. Well, if the only reason you fast is so that everybody can think you're spiritual, that's your reward. That's what it says. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount is about. But whatever you do it because you want to glorify God. When it's not about you, but it's about Him. Whenever you, you realize that I want to press into the kingdom of God, so I go in my prayer closet and I pray more than I've ever prayed before. Come on, church, there used to be a time when you first got saved, you would pray every night, you'd pray every morning, you'd find time in your day to pray, you'd get away and pray, and you was pressing into the kingdom. You wanted to know more about the Word of God, you were hungry for the kingdom of God, and I guarantee you in that time of your life, you saw more signs and wonders and miracles and answered prayer in your life than you ever did. Then we kind of get comfortable. And we, we, we begin to live with the spot on us instead of getting clean. We need to press in. Amen. There was a time when you first got saved, you wanted more of God, so you, you would stop eating for two or three days. It's called fasting. And you didn't tell anybody about it. You was pressing into the kingdom of God. You wanted a promise to be answered. You wanted your brother to be saved, your wife to be changed, your children to be changed. And you begin to put away some food and fast. And you went into your prayer closet and you prayed and you was pressing into the kingdom. And you would see miracles and signs and wonders happen. Let me tell you, when some member of your family gets saved, that's a miracle. 
Amen. Why did all that happen? Because we were fervent. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Where's our fervency? We get into our routines. Well, you know, too much of that church, you know, that, too much of that Christian stuff make you crazy. No, you already crazy. You need more of Jesus if you want to get your mind on straight. Come on. The kingdom of God is here. And the Bible actually says, beware when they say it's over there, over there. You've got to go over here to get it to go. No, the kingdom of God is at hand. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. Every one of you has the Holy Spirit just hovering over you, hovering over you, waiting for you to just say, he said, press in, press into the kingdom a little bit. Come on, young man, press into the kingdom. If you just press in a little bit, then God's going to press into you. He's going to grab a hold of you. Hunger. I think uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, it says that Jesus said, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Do you still have a void in your life? Maybe you're just not hungry for the kingdom of God. Maybe you now have too many other things that you've been eating and drinking, unclean things, and now you're learning to live with that instead of say, you know what? I'm going to shake off those things and I'm going to press into the kingdom of God. See, what happens is we begin to compromise, and it's like, well, you know, nothing really bad happened, so I guess I can continue to compromise. And then you start drifting further and further and further away from the kingdom of God, and you just become religious. Ooh. And it's amazing how we can see everybody else's problems, but we can't see our own. Go with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 11. Do you know that God always does things a strange way? Yeah, come on. He does. God does things different, and and, and it rattles us sometimes. And that may be why He does it differently, just to make you wake up and say, Well, I'm going to go check this out. I'm going to study this thing out. I want to find out. I want to press into the kingdom. Let me tell you, I don't want to be deceived. In fact, I love the truth. I'm not going to be deceived. Amen. I don't just let anybody lay hands on me. I didn't go down there to get hands laid on me. I went down there to see what was going on because it's affecting churches all over the country. It's affecting them in positive ways and in negative ways. Amen. Look at Matthew uh, uh, chapter 11. And look with me at verse 5. It says, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Do you know that when you get offended, it's something that's going to stop that anointing from working in your own life? Don't be offended at something you don't always understand. Now, why did he put all these signs and wonders and miracles? And then right after that, he says, watch out because, you know, some people are offended by this power that I have. You know, there is still power in the kingdom of God. I mean, when did the power go away? When we stopped believing in it. When we are offended by it, when we don't understand it. And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the field and, and to go see or into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft clothing? Silk suits? $5,000 suits? Let me tell you, this isn't a $5,000 suit. This is where you get two for uh, two hundred dollars, you know. Buy one, get one free, or whatever. Says, well, what are you going to see? The pomp and circumstance, you know. But what did what what do we want to see? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? 
Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before my face, who will prepare the way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of woman, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In other words, John the Baptist was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. But you guys that are now born again in the kingdom of God, every one of us, according to what Jesus said, has a greater standing in the kingdom than even John did. So we don't have to go seeking after people. We need to seek the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus teaches us. Seek first the kingdom of God. Press into the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Thank you Lord. He says, from the days of John the Baptist, just like we read in the other portion, until, the kingdom, until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Those who press in are going to get it. You know, sometimes your miracle can be right here. But this is how I am. Well, you know. Uh, I believe in miracles. I just hope it happens to me. And then it don't happen to you. Know, well, nothing good ever happens to me. I want you all to know, Jesus changed my life. I'm very excited about Jesus. Don't you want to be like me? Where's your passion? Where's your passion? Where's that twinkle in your eye when you first got saved and you're like, wow. And you said, I don't have a Bible. I need a Bible. And then pastor starts to preach and you say, I want to find that in the Bible. I want to make sure he's preaching out the Bible. And you start studying it yourself. You start opening it up and you're pressing into the kingdom of God and you're talking to God and you're praying to God. But we, we, we cannot be... Uh, lackadaisical and, and expect to see the manifestation of the kingdom in our lives. If there would be an, a big alarm would go off today and they'd say that we're being invaded by another country and it's time to go to war. Don't you think something fervent would happen on the inside of you if you knew someone was coming to your house to kill you and your family? Don't you think the men would gather together and say, let's take up arms. We're going to fight together. We're going to make a fortress. We're going to stand together. We're going to stand against this which is trying to destroy us. Or would we just kind of be, well, you know, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. And do you all know that there's a war going on, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The devil wants to destroy you. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you may have life and life more abundantly. Men, if you don't fight for your families, nobody will. When an attacker comes against your family, why aren't you on your knees? Why aren't you fasting for two or three or four days? Why aren't you pressing into the kingdom with a passion? Where's your fervent prayer? But we get hit and we kind of get days like that and we kind of get disappointed and we give up and we wonder, well, you know, I've been paying my tithe, I go to church, I do this and all. This should have never happened to me. The Bible never said it wasn't going to happen to you, that the enemy wasn't going to attack you. But when he hits you, it's time to fight back. It's time to press in. It's time to fast and pray. It's time to believe God. You know, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He may not devour me. He may not have my children. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to stand up against him. I'm going to resist him steadfastly, steadfastly in the faith. And if you don't do it, who's going to do it? You're expecting your pastor to do it for you? The Bible doesn't say pastor's supposed to do that for you. Come on, men. You're the priest of your own house. Come on, ladies, you're supposed to be running that house. I didn't say head, I said run it. Come on, don't hear, don't hear something I didn't say. Someone said, well, I don't know about that. Well, 
Come on. The Bible says that a woman's supposed to be the housekeeper. Supposed to be running that house. Covered by her husband, who is covered by Jesus Christ. Setting things in order so the enemy can't come in to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm going to be talking about how, how to have a successful home. That's going to be one of the things I'm going to be moving into in the next series. I'm studying in it right now. Let me ask you, how many of y'all are really seeking the kingdom of God? Really seeking. Are you really seeking? Every day, you're seeking His will, seeking the kingdom of God. How many of y'all understand what earnest prayer is? Oh, God, we just pray, we hope that you would help us through this situation. No, no, come on. Let's talk about some earnest prayer. What is earnest prayer? There's going to be some travailing. There's going to be some weeping. There's going to be some getting excited about some things. You're going to be telling the devil where he can go. Get thee behind me, Satan. In the name of Jesus, God, you promised me. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Me and my house is going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. And you begin to stand on the Word of God and you pray fervently. It's not volume. It's authority. It's believing. Now, it's okay to turn up a little volume if it takes that to be passionate. What is passion? Passion is that thing that got on me when I met Mary. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You fall in love. I mean, after you work all day, you can work, you know, 14 hours, but you still got to see her and hold her hand before you go to bed that night. That's passion. How many of know what I'm talking about? There's something that drives you to go a little further, to do a little bit more. You become hot for the things of God. You never give up. You know, people give up. They, they serve God and then something goes wrong and they give up. They're like, well, this shouldn't have happened. Who told you that it wasn't going to happen? The storms come on both houses, the wise and the foolish. But the wise man who does the will of God, the house does not fall. But we think, well, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be exempt of any of these problems. Baloney. Never give up. See, that's pressing in. Never give up. Any of y'all ever work on something mechanical? And it seems like the more you work on it, the more it breaks. Amen. Y'all ever had something like that you worked on? And you know that you should have been able to fix it in about 30 minutes, and you've been at that thing for three hours, and you aggravated. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You know you're wasting your time, and you're ready to take the whole thing and just throw it in the trash. But there's something on the inside of you that says, I'm going to conquer, I'm going to fix that thing. If it takes me the rest of this day or the next two days, this thing's not going to get me. I'm going to get it. It's going to be fixed by the time I'm finished this thing. And you could have went by a new one, but you went ahead and fixed that thing even though it cost you more than getting a new one. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't know what I'm talking about. See, that's not giving up. When your marriage starts to go bad, let me tell you, work on it and fix it. Don't give up and go get another one. You know, some people, their, their job, they go to work and they have a bad day, then they want to quit. Oh, come on now. That's not passion. That's not fervency. You say, well, I just want to work with a bunch of Christians. You're not going to find that. Even the Christians are not Christians. At work. You ever notice that? You work with somebody for two years and then you find, oh, you're a Christian? Oh, I never knew that. They turn around, but well, you're a Christian. I didn't know that either. Uh-huh. Forceful, forcefully, forcefully pressing in. Come on, guys. Take it by force. Take it. Take it. Turn to your neighbor and say, take it. Now, when the enemy has something that belongs to you, take it. I love the story about King David. He's just sitting there and he's reminiscing. And he says, boy, I sure would like to have a drink from my father's well, from Jacob's well. Three of his mighty men heard his desire. The enemy was controlling the well. And those three men went and take some water. 
They went into the midst of the enemy's camp and went and got David some water so that he could have his thirst quenched just because the king wanted a drink. The three mighty men, servants, warriors went in by force and took some water and brought it to the king. Now that's passion. They put their lives on the line just so that their king could drink from a well that he desired to drink from. Now that's a relationship with the king. And see, the king, Jesus says, I want to drink. I want you to worship me. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to get free and worship me. But no, we're not even passionate enough to do this. Oh, another song. When the Bible tells us that it's biblical to worship God with lifted hands. I can tell you that service down there started at 7 o'clock. And two hours later they were still singing and worshiping God. Two hours. You ever try to hold your hands up for two hours? That's passion. That's passion. That's a hunger. So don't care what you think about all the other stuff, I can tell you that there are hungry people. And where's our hunger for the things of God? Have you ever been angry? Let me just stop right there. I want to finish this. But anybody in here ever been angry? If you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. So we can pray, we can pray about lying later. But you ever met somebody in your family that had an opinion that you didn't agree with? And they were very passionate about their opinion. Huh? You talk politics or you talk religion or you talk, and they got their own opinion. And next thing you know, it's, it's about to turn into a fight. Amen. Now, we need to get rid of all of our opinions. Come on. I, I have this written down. All my hurts, my ideas, and my opinions about myself. I need to give to God. I need to find out what the Word of God says about me. All of my ideas about God's spirituality and how the Christian life is supposed to work, I need to let it all go and surrender to the truth of His Word. What happens when you find out that what you've been believing for 50 years is not in the Bible? Uh Uh-oh. I'm going to say it again. What happens when you find out that what you've been believing... For 50 years is not in the Bible. Are you going to change? Are you going to say, nope, I've been believing in 50 years. I was born that way. I'm going to die that way. What if you spent all your life believing that holiness is given to you because you don't cut your hair and you wear a dress and you wear long sleeves and that holiness comes because of the way you dress or your outward appearance. Now that's called modesty. That's not where you get holiness from. Holiness is imparted as the, from the mercy and the grace and it's a gift from God that it gives to you. You cannot earn it. Amen. And then you find that out, what are you going to do? What if you find out that the way you've been praying for the last 40 years is not biblical? That you're praying to all of these saints, and you cannot find one scripture in the Bible where you pray to saints, but the Bible way to pray says to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, are you going to be fervent enough to say, I'm going to receive the truth and I'm going to change and let the truth set me free, or are you going to continue to pray opposed to the scripture? Because you've got to find out what the truth says. The Bible says, pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We pray to God. God is the one who hears prayer. God is the one who answers prayer. Now that challenges us. See, people don't like me to bring those things up. But I challenge you to go find in the scripture where they prayed to anyone but to God. But see, we have our opinions. We have our our, our traditions, and you know the Bible says that your traditions, there's a scripture that says that your traditions will make the word of God of no effect in your life if you believe the traditions more than you believe the word of God. 
So it stops the Word of God from working in your lives. But you've got to be passionate for truth. You'll know the truth and the truth will what? Make you free. How many of y'all have a burning heart for more of God? I know some of y'all do because I, I talk to you. And you like talking about Jesus. All you want to do is talk about Jesus. Talk about more of, of the Lord. You got a burning heart for the things of God. That's passion. Where is that fire? Now, you know, you know, one of the things I've found over the years I've been a Christian is that you got the, these theologically perfect people. You know, that, that's all they do is get into the theology. But whenever they talk, they'll put you to sleep. Yeah, you ever met them guys before? They got their theology. And they're basically reading their theology to you. And they don't have any passion. And then you got these people that are very passionate. But they have no theology. You ever met some of them? They're just excited. They don't even know what they're excited about. But they're excited. And they, 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 can, they can preach and preach and holler. And you don't even know what they said. But, and you, oh yeah, yeah. And everybody's you know, right behind them all the way. But you don't even know what they're saying. What about if we would have somebody that would be accurately theology, with, with theology and also passionate? That's what we all should strive to be. Amen? I want the truth, but I want it to be passionate. I want you to be passionate about the truth in your life. See, the kingdom of God is here. How I many of y'all believe that? That's what the Word of God says. But we've got to access it. We've got to penetrate into it. We've got to enter into it. Amen. Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 3. Thank you, Jesus. I want to start with verse 14. It says, To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that they are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that they were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, some of your Bibles will actually say vomit. Lukewarmness makes the Lord sick in his stomach. Can I say it that way? Now, are we cold or hot or lukewarm? So what I'm talking about is having a kindle, a rekindling of the fire of God on the inside of us where we get passionate and hot for the things of God. Where we're pressing in, where we're fasting and praying, where we're believing God to change our world. Look at verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See, we get, we get into this lukewarmness and we don't even realize that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked spiritually. We're ready for attack. The enemy can take us out. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. That you may be rich. And can I say truly rich with the things of God. And white garments. I talked about being pure. We sang the song about being pure. Come on. If you've got spots in your life, allow God to clean those spots out. That's how I got saved, my friends. My lifestyle was unclean when I was a young man. And, and it was so unclean, I decided there was something in me that said, I want to be clean, God. I, I want something to cleanse me. And I didn't know anybody or anything but God that was able to do that. And God revealed himself to me. He says, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eyes have that you may see. I want God to show us the truth. 
As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. How many know that a good rebuke every now and then is good? How many of y'all like to be rebuked? <laughs> I mean, if I rebuke somebody, they'll they might, they liable to leave the church. That's not how you ought to live. Let me tell you something. If you're married and you're sleeping with somebody else, that's called adultery. And you need to stop. I rebuke adultery in the name of Jesus. Now you see, so ooh. And boy, I could go on with some more sins and rebuke it. And some, some of us, we said, well, that, that doesn't affect me. But how about if you've been lazy? Just spiritually lazy, naturally lazy? I rebuke that laziness in Jesus' name. You know, so, so the Lord says, as many as I love, I rebuke and, rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous. Say zealous. And repent. That means get on fire again. Be zealous. Be excited about the things of God. And repent. Turn your life back around. Get it right with God. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will open the door. And I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Do you have an ear to hear? <laughs> Jacob, you can come on up. I want to go right now to 2 Timothy as he comes. Chapter 2. We've got to be excited. We've got to set ourselves on fire for God again. The kingdom of God is here, and those who are pressing into it are receiving what they need. Amen? The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What did you come here today to see? A Bayou Blunt preacher preach again? What did you come to see? What so-and-so was wearing when they came in, the clothes that they wore, the way they had their hair? What did you come to see? Is it, is it about us? Is it about our outward appearance? Why did you come here today? I hope you came because you're hungry for the kingdom. And you want more of the kingdom of God in your life. I love young Christians when they get saved in that first year or so. Every time you talk to them, they just talk about, man, it's, oh, I didn't, wow, I never knew. Oh, God is so real. I never knew. God has so changed my life. I used to be this way and God's changed me. Oh, I mean, they're just, oh, they're just talking about, and that's, that's supernatural. Amen? He cha he's changing my desires. He's changing the center of my being. He's refocusing me on the, the things of God. Now listen to what this scripture says. Verse 22 of chapter 2. Flee also youthful lust. That means run away from those, those childish, lustful things. Flee. Get away from it. Run away from it. Come on, y'all know what lust does to us? Those, those fleshly desires. They destroy us. Can I talk very plainly with you? STDs are, are just running rampant in our high schools. The young ladies and young men, y'all have no idea how many diseases are in those other people that are sexually active in those schools. You have no idea. And the thing is, is you can catch one of them and you don't even know you have it until you get older and you find out that you can't have children because when you was in high school, you had sex for five minutes and you got chlamydia and now you're not able to have babies anymore. So your parents and, and the other person that you married parents will never become grandparents because you had to have some kind of sexual experience for five minutes because you could not flee from youthful lust. It takes a passion for God 
greater than a, a fleshly passion. Whenever you come to the place where you're being tempted sexually and talking about passion, that's a strong area. Sexual immorality is one of the strongest things in, in this world today that's destroying more marriages and more young people and more families than anything else, guys. Sexual immorality is destroying families more than drug addiction. Because it all comes together. They take the drugs, they drink the beer, they have sex. Or they have sex and they feel guilty and shame. So the way that they get over it is get with their other friends that are having sex. And they laugh about it and drink beer and do drugs. And just laugh about it like it doesn't matter. Am I preaching to the right people? This is happening not in New York City. This is happening in a Vaughn's Parish. It was years ago that one of the statistics that I read in a Vols Parish, this was probably 10 years ago or 8 years or more, that said one out of 10 people in this parish had HIV back then. See, there's a reason to be more passionate about the things of God. Because it's going to strip off all the other stuff. And whenever they come to tempt you, when temptation comes, you say, Oh, no, I love Jesus. And if you're going to go out with me, how about you and Jesus? Do, do you know Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Say, well, Pastor, once, once I marry him, he's going to change. <laughs> how many of y'all married people know that doesn't work? Go on, wave your hand real big so the others that ain't married can see. Say, once I marry her, I'm going to change. I, I'll change. She'll become a Christian after I marry her. He'll become a Christian after I marry her. God's going to really be able to get him once I marry him. Woo, that don't work like that, does it? Hallelujah. He says, flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So we're supposed to run after the things of God, right? But look at what it says. With those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Who are you hanging around with? Who are you hanging around with? Is the people that you're hanging around with calling on the Lord? If they're not, you're not going to end up in the right place. You've got to flee the youthful lust, pursue love, peace, and righteousness with those who love God. And call upon Him with a pure heart. Amen. you got to find people who love God and call upon Him with a pure heart. How many of you know you, that you hang around with the people that you uh, more like? So if you hang around with people who smoke, you're going to end up smoking. You hang around with people who drink, you're going to end up drinking. You hang around with people who do drugs, you're going to end up doing drugs. You hang around people that have sex, you're going to end up having sex. You hang around with people who love Jesus, you're going to love Jesus. You hang around with people that go to church, you're going to end up going to church. Isn't that simple? Passionate for the things of God. I want to thank you today for joining us for this broadcast. I believe that you've heard the Word of God and that that Word can change your life. I know that many of you that are watching right now are suffering with many things. Some are suffering physically with sickness and disease. Some of us suffer mentally with depression and oppression. Some of us are suffering, fi suffering financially. We've lost jobs. We've been bankrupt. Many pressures of the world come. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray that God would just bring peace to your heart and begin to change the circumstances of your life. So join with me right now as I pray and believe God for a miracle in your life, a change in your life. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of those that are watching right now on television, that are in the sound of my voice, that you by your Holy Spirit will touch them right now and bring healing to their bodies, peace to their minds, restoration to what's been stolen away. Father, open doors that they'll have new jobs. Open doors that their finances would be able to 
to meet the needs that they have. We're not asking to, to be extravagant, extravagantly rich, Lord God. We're asking you to just meet the needs today. To heal the sick today that are watching on television. To heal the broken marriages today, Lord God. To heal the broken minds and the, the oppressed and the depressed. That the joy of the Lord once again would come into their lives. So Lord, touch those that are watching right now on television. In Jesus' name. Do a miracle. Those of you that are watching right now, believe and receive and touch God with your faith and say, God, today is the day I believe for my turnaround. You need to say that to God. Today is the day I believe you for a turnaround. God bless you. Now, I would just love to hear testimonies of things that God has done through what we just prayed and asked God to do. It's not only my faith that takes your faith, but our faith together can move mountains, is what Jesus said. But you know what? Those natural miracles are nothing to compare to the miracle of salvation. If you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you need to ask Him today to be the Lord of your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me that you was buried and that God raised you from the dead. I believe in the resurrection. And I ask you today to be my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart and into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. See, give your life to Jesus because Jesus wants to give his life to you. I want to thank you again for allowing me to speak into your heart the Word of God. It is such a privilege for me to be part of this community and share God's word with you. God bless you. Come visit us. I hope to see you soon. And remember, God knows everything about you and loves you anyway.